All right, welcome everybody to what is our final session for our 39th annual conference, Sea Change, Life Worlds and Ecological Upheaval. Uh, special thanks to everyone who's attended and participated to our planning team. Um, Anna and Tom as part of our help desk have been absolutely amazing. Mark Flanagan for helping uh, bring this entire thing together. Nicole Torres, uh, our journals managing editor and every single participant, attendee, um, and presenter, and including all our folks on the Twitch stream. Uh, we've had an amazing transformative time here, um, and it wouldn't have been as special and as important and as relevant as it is without all of your help and participation. Um, one of the great things about SAC conferences is that we are an interdisciplinary uh, organization that likes to explore consciousness from an anthropological lens, but from a lot of different perspectives. And our conferences Sometimes the most memorable aspects of them are the experientials, are the things that aren't necessarily a bunch of academics and PhDs sitting down to read papers that they've written, although those have been fantastic over the past uh, few days. Um, but sometimes it's these events that, get, that spark our curiosity. We've had more questions since this started. What's this hippie thing about? What's going on? Who's this, right? And so the generation of that buzz and that curiosity and that mystery um, is part of what makes these conferences so exciting. And so uh, I'm happy to be in this event and I'm happy you're all here with us. Uh, I wanna begin, I'm Andy Gervich, uh, the president of the organization. I probably should have said that sooner. Um, I'd like to start with a quick land acknowledgement. I'm speaking to you today from Portland, Oregon, um, as it's now so-called, uh, which rests on traditional village sites of the Multnomah, the Kathlamet, the Clackamas, Chinook, the Tualatin Kalapua, the Malala and many other tribes and bands. Uh, as the original caretakers of this land, I wanna begin by acknowledging their presence, their dignity, their continued struggle for respect, for restoration, for reparation. Um, I wouldn't be here today if they hadn't been here first. I wouldn't be here able to speak to you from this space in this very building on this land if they hadn't been displaced from it first. And so we want to acknowledge that we want to use our organization uh, to be a small part of the conversation to help create uh, a restoration and reparation for that. Um, and uh, this panel, like uh, this presentation, like the others, is uh, is a small part of that. Uh, just a couple of quick announcements, uh, and then we'll turn it over to Mark to introduce uh, Carrie, our guest. Um, please, uh, for the sake of bandwidth, keep yourself muted, and for now at least, keep your cameras off. Uh, there might be a time later when we can open it up for a time of back and forth and sharing, but for now, just for the sake of continuity and bandwidth, if you could keep your cameras and your microphones off, uh, but turn your chat window on. The chat window already is filled with information about, um, it's not really any upcoming sessions other than our Anthropology of Consciousness business meeting, which will be the final event for the night, which we hope many of you attend, but will not be as exciting as this. Um, but we'll be giving you loads of information in there about the organization, about the session, links to things. Um, and this will be where you will primarily be interacting with one another and with our speaker. And so put your questions in there, put your comments in there, uh, and we'll do our best to gather them uh, and then ask them at the end. If you also, the other thing you can do is just jot your questions down as you think of them and then post them in the chat box at the end. Last thing and then we're on to our session. You have a live transcript button across the bottom of your page. If you roll your name across the bottom of the page, you'll see uh, almost to the third, second or third, everyone might, might look a little different from the far right. You have this thing that says live transcript. This is Zoom's AI captioning service. It does a pretty good job if captioning is something that will be of service to you. Uh, by all means, enable that for yourself. Uh, it's only about 90% accurate. So some folks find it confusing. Uh, and if that's the case, you don't need to engage it. Uh, since we are in a Zoom meeting, uh, you do have access to your name as well. And so if you click on the participants button, which is there across the bottom around the middle, just next to the chat function, um, you'll be able to see all the participants in the meeting. And then if you would like to, uh, you can change your name. We'd like you to keep your name uh, as close to or exact to the name you registered with. So we know who's in the room to keep it safe. But if you'd like to, you can see some folks have already done it. You could add your preferred pronouns as well. You absolutely don't have to do this, but it helps uh, keep the space more welcoming, more inclusive, more diverse. And uh, we're happy to have you do that if you choose so. Okay, with that, I wanna hand things over to our program coordinator, Dr. Mark Flanagan to introduce the mysterious and elusive hippity-hoppity. 
<laughs> Thank you so much, Andy. And uh, I just, I wanted to make a clarification. So not a doctor, um, but I do have many master's degrees. So I'm certainly, I've been in my fair share of classes, but anyways. You're a doctor um, of love. <laughs> um, so I just wanted to um, also echo my love and acknowledgement for everyone that has helped create this conference uh, near and far. Um, so this was really a team event and um, that includes all the participants as well. Thank you so much for dedicating your energy um, to making this space possible. Um, I also want to make a land acknowledgement. Um, here behind me is uh, one of my favorite spaces is in uh, Savannah. Uh, severely colonized and um, oppressed uh, indig indigenous communities, as well as um, enslaved peoples who were brought here and formed their own beautiful communities, um, the Gullah Geechee and, and others um, in, in these areas. Um, so I just say that um, in deep, humble respect. Um, and uh, I also uh, wanted to uh, encourage everyone to just uh, Thank yourself and and uh, for participating and providing this space. Um, where uh, I know that I've found myself kind of in a work and kind of producing environment, but it's also good to reflect and embody. Um, so I, uh, I I think that's what this will be getting at. Um, but we are all very excited to um, hear from our presenter Carrie Miller um, from John F. Kennedy University, um, and. Uh, she will be sharing a short story and poem um, and providing her personal connection to the story, uh, followed by a meditation and grounding. Um, but I'll hand this over to you, Carrie. Thank you so much for participating and um, take it away. <clears throat> Thank you. That was so nice and uh, warming from both of you, especially since we're online. Um, I'm assuming everybody can hear me okay still. Yes, you sound good. Yes. Cool. <clears throat> um, well, I just want to kind of first acknowledge um, all of those things. Um, I'm here in Oakland, California on O Lone pro property. Um, and so, yeah, I want to be grateful for that. Um, give respect to that. A lot of displaced people currently definitely seeing gentrification happening in my neighborhood, trying to be aware of my place in that. Um, so much happening in the world right now, definitely lots of shifting. Um, and so this is just kind of a poem I wrote um, when I was going through my own sort of um, shifting or awakening um, and how that process happened for me moving into embodiment um, so yeah, I guess I'll read that and then I'll talk about it a little bit more, um, of how that kind of came about. Um, but yeah, I just, I do, I do want to connect the current events to the, to the way that this poem came out for me of just, <clears throat> you know, awakening into a greater consciousness beyond just our minds and our conceptual interpretation of the world. Um, so this is Hippity Hoppity. Amongst the trees and the bees, over the hills and within the tills, atop the peaks to anywhere I might seek, I wandered and often pondered, sometimes day, sometimes night, in the black and through the white, walking and often talking with what may appear here and trying to take it there. It all seemed clear holding everything so near. After all, it was so dear. When I came upon a ridge, I was unsure of how to bridge where I seemed to be to a place far in front of me. Scheming up a plan with thoughts and retro ban, my brain quite in a twist, the only thing left was to fist. But suddenly spewed a mist, no time to think, all in such a blink. I was no longer walking, nor frolicking, nor trying or denying. Aware faded my despair. Completely set free, there I was to be. 
it all falling in front of me. And as I fell, a part of me could tell, without thought, not being fought, let alone to be, my legs knew what to do with me. With no end in sight, I gave up all spite and quietly fading into the white night. <clears throat> um, yeah, so I just uh, kind of like everybody to, maybe we can try just, just before I give an explanation, um, just see how that lands with you. Um, you know, the major points for me were like seeing really beautiful things and wanting to take them along with us. Um, and feeling kind of lost and trying to understand and calculate with our mind, getting into a, a twist and sort of being stuck. And then my experience, which was like falling, so suffering. And um, in that falling came surrender because there was nothing else I could do. And um, suddenly my body knew what to do. And I found a greater sense of knowledge and consciousness and wisdom. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, this was uh, all in 2016 when I wrote this. Um, and it was at the culmination of my uh, college degree. Um, and I was uh, really suffering, you know, I had, the job and the money and um, my degree, um, but I just felt unhappy. And um, then that was like a process of yoga and I went to Costa Rica and sort of this, this process of healing through embodiment which in, within nature. And, um, you know, I think uh, we're, all, we're all, I don't know where everybody's from or what your understanding of things are what you study, but I think a lot of us can see how over time we've become separated from the land, from the earth. You know, we cut down big trees all the time without thinking. We clear lots before we build things. And um, to me, that represents not only a disconnection from the earth, which supplies us with what we need, but a disconnection from ourselves, from our own body. So the earth body, our, our soul body, our physical body and then our our soul body or our cosmic body um and this sort of like relationship of all bodies within the universe um and so what i found through this process was by um giving up my need to understand within my mind i could live in a way that was a um a wisdom through my body and that was that's a process it's a continuous process it's like a um excavation i think of anthropology and um uh what is what is ross what is ross on friends um paleontology uh and digging up bones um that's what i feel like is happening within me right as we like as we work on embodiment so, you know, let's, let's, let's uh, check in right now before we do the meditation. So notice how you're, um, how you're sitting. Notice how you feel, are you comfortable? Do you feel your feet on the ground or on your bed or whatever you're sitting on? Can you hear my voice? Can you feel your stomach going in and out? Your chest rising and falling. Can you let go of needing to understand and just be here? Feeling like the many verses, the universe, the multiverse of uh, your cells and your organs 
and how that touches your skin and then suddenly you're outside your body but yet there's still a relationship to that um so i wanted to do um, a meditation but uh, i was wondering if maybe we could try to have the cameras on for a little bit for people who feel comfortable with that So um, I wanted to um, maybe maybe talk a little more, do a meditation, but I was curious if, um, if anybody wanted to share what their experience with embodiment has been, um, like where you are now versus where you were before. Before could be whatever, you know, yesterday or a year ago or if you started yoga or like what is what has been a shift you've noticed or something about your story maybe just just a little snippet if nobody has anything that's totally okay So I'd like to share my story. Um, so for me, I'd always been, or I've learned that school was a good thing and I really appreciated school. It's got me a lot of things. I found myself relying on my mind a lot and that got me into a lot of issues, um, mental health issues, relationship issues and other items to that. And it was really through an experience in college um, where I was brought back into my body from kind of some reckoning with some truths that about myself, um, about my dedication to school, perhaps too much. Um, and I, it, it was really like something broke apart in me uh, for a bit. And it was only by coming back to my body, my experience in my body that I was able to reintegrate in a different way. And, and understand the world in a different way. And in a large way led me to anthropology um, and to what I am currently invested in right now, which is body psychotherapy and embodiment as a healing tool um, through horticultural therapy and other practices. And, and I resonate a lot with this story and kind of your, your personal story as well. So I just wanted to recognize that. Um, but the, the fact that iterations, I, I, one piece that stuck out to me was the fact that there are iterations of this and that it, it, it comes in waves and in different um, epics, if you will. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to share that. Thank you for your, your story and thank you for providing this. Thanks, Mark. Yeah, like I feel that too where, um, <clears throat> so something you're touching on that, uh, connects with my story and was was a was a predominant thing for like this poem as well is just um, that like shifting uh, back into our body kind of and how it it balances us right and like when you talk about mental illness and I, I'll relate that to physical illness as well in that um, like the way that our mind dominates so much of our experience is really um, just a, it's beautiful in a sense, it's part of our evolution, but now it's realizing that it, it needs to be rebalanced again, or it has learned. We don't, we're not, we're not, I mean, we're, to say we're not messing up is to, to take away responsibility, but I don't mean that. I mean, it's all like a discovery, right? we like became so intelligent and we've seen what we can build and that's so beautiful, but we've also seen that destruction. And so now it's like, how can we integrate this and rebalance this so that there's a more holistic view so we can have our earth and we can still survive here. And that's how I look at like embodiment or allowing, allowing um, our personal process of evolution that is like more quote unquote scary. So like 
um, a picture someone gave me once was a lot of us are living with a pyramid, uh, upside down pyramid, right? So we have the, so much of our experience is up here, but a lot of our body is down here. So if you, we want to have a more balanced life, then it's about like kind of switching that pyramid upside down and not being afraid of losing um, the beauty of thinking, but just realizing that it's like a tool. And so using it in a more effective and um, intentional way. So we choose when to use it. So what embodiment has done for me is allowed me to move my attention rather than telling myself to stop thinking because thinking um, probably most of us have noticed how thinking can cause <laughs> a lot of problems. <clears throat> I don't know about you, but I can make a lot of assumptions really fast and go off on somebody. And then they're like, wow, none of that was true. And you just did a whole thing. And we just got in this three hour argument and, um, all that really had to happen <clears throat> was just checking in. Right. And, um, that's hard to control when we don't have other tools. So that's what embodiment is for me. Yeah. So um, now maybe we could all uh, practice it a little bit if you'd like to. Um, so I was just gonna lead a little bit more of a body meditation um, that helps me just can, um, <clears throat> I think it's important to have uh, techniques or things or ways of being that you can easily incorporate in your day so that yeah it's good to have that space of like you know maybe your sacred time or your intentional you know healing ritual but then also allowing that to spread over into daily life helps um, with like integration and then it has helped me learn how to live differently rather than like um, you know rather than like dieting and trying to control or meditating over here, I can also like do it in my daily life. So um, <clears throat> yeah, just, uh, we're just going to take a few minutes um, to kind of practice like giving yourself some tools or connections to, uh, to focus your, to focus your attention. So to allow it to move to other places. So um if you want to just, uh, if you need your camera off or whatever makes you feel comfortable, no problem there. So um, we're just going to do a few minutes and remember that, you know, this is about allowing yourself to be, to be comfortable and to trust yourself. So for me, another part of embodiment is a process of inviting <clears throat> and, um, being honest about our history of violation and exploitation and abuse of the body. So just as much as we wanna heal and become embodied is respecting our own relationship with our body and its history of being pushed. So our body knows, it knows what's safe and it knows what's not. So sometimes when there's resistance, that's because it's not safe yet, it's not time. And that's okay, we, we are gonna approach things when we're ready because there's no reason to uncover something that we're not ready to handle. So um, this is my invitation to you to follow along, but it's also an invitation to invite yourself and to um, honor your boundaries. So if that means stopping in the middle of it and like, you know, looking around or um, feeling your hands or walking away or eating something, you know, whatever makes you feel comfortable if, if you get into a place that feels like it's kind of an edge. So um, yeah, that's sort of my, my invitation and layout there. Um, so then if you feel okay, um, <clears throat> allowing yourself to get comfortable where you are. So we're just going to do a few minutes. We're just going to kind of work on um, starting at the top and bringing the energy down to our feet and to our, our connection with the actual earth or the earth body. Um, and it's, it's also important to use terms that you feel comfortable with. So if uh, someone says universe and you prefer your higher power or God or 
um, you know, planets or science, um, that that's your relationship. <clears throat> so yeah, just uh, finding a comfortable place. And just for now, not trying to do anything. Just hearing my voice, maybe noticing if there's any noises in your environment. And we're just gonna start out with like some acceptance. Just feeling like acceptance of the current state of how things are. Maybe within us or around us. So just kind of like um, that acceptance can be um, accepting all parts of myself. So I'm sort of inviting all of Carrie to be here. I'm accepting her, everything she's done, everything she's been, she's just trying to figure it out. So I'm kind of inviting all of me and breathing with that. And then uh, bringing our attention um, to like the head and maybe noticing like if we've been thinking a lot, if our head sort of hurts or if there's areas that are pulling, maybe our forehead's wrinkled, just feeling our like brain forehead. And if it's difficult to feel it, you can just, you can use your hands, you know, you can put your hands there or you can imagine with your, you know, your mind's eye, just imagine that part of your head that helps to develop that relationship. And then moving down from the head Maybe allowing that, uh, all that energy that was there about thinking and figuring out and just allowing it to come down into the chin and neck. And just feeling like burping a little bit. Maybe your throat itches a little or you want to swallow. Our throat is how we how we speak, how we communicate. So just uh, acknowledging that expression of ourselves. And then like feeling the tongue a little. Maybe you feel it on the top of your mouth or you use your teeth. You just kind of move it around a little and like feeling that go down into your throat. And then a deep breath in and just let it go and relax and just notice like where your mind is and if you're thinking, just notice it. It's okay, we're just practicing, you know. And then gently, you know, bringing that attention back to the shoulders. Maybe your shoulders are tight. So noticing it first and then and then giving it permission to relax. Come into the chest and feeling our, our lungs and heart. And maybe feeling like some gratitude for just um, just the ability to experience. And you can relax. This is really just an opportunity to kind of move some energy down. No pressure or no hurry. Plenty of time. Coming down into the chest and feeling like the arms, the weight of your arms. I feel the weight of my arms on my legs. And feeling the diaphragm, the way it like moves the lungs up and the, the intestines down. Your stomach is moving, or your chest.
And, you know, anytime we get a little distracted, just, just noticing that and gently bringing our attention back. It's okay. There, there. Feeling our intestines. Your liver's on your right side of your rib cage and your stomach's on the left. Maybe if you want, you can take your hands over your abdominal area, give a little massage, gentle massage. <clears throat> and just uh, feeling like that power and our, our emotional feeling center, the knowledge and wisdom that it holds another nervous system there. So intelligent, processing all our food and turning it into energy, telling us when things aren't safe. So awesome. Maybe we feel our back a little, mine's a little tight. Your kidneys back there right behind your rib cage. Give yourself a little back massage, a little love. <clears throat> and then, then just letting that go. Just relaxing, noticing like maybe how you feel, if everything feels okay. You know, if there's like some things coming up, just kind of kind of noticing how you're experiencing things here. And now we're, we're going to do the second half of the body, just a few more minutes of the legs. Not too long, you know. Take a deep breath. Let it go. You can always readjust. You know, there's no right way to do this. This is just a practice to feel your body, you know, and develop that focus. And when you're ready, uh, just noticing your hips. How do your hips feel? Do they feel comfortable? Do they feel like um, aligned if you're sitting? Does one feel above the other or tight? And you know, anytime it's hard to feel it, just you can use your hands or you can um, picture the image, you know? Just bringing that down through the legs into the thighs, feeling the, the muscle tingling a little, maybe rubbing your legs if you need to. And into the knees. Coming down over the shin. And just bring in your bring in your attention back if you're somewhere else if that's if that feels okay you know the shin the ankle maybe you move your ankles if that helps or just kind of imagine all the joints and uh, ligaments and feel the feel the um, the inner workings there And then lastly, maybe feeling your feet on the floor, the soles of your feet, they're kind of like hands, they have that connection. And just breathing. And um, <clears throat> just getting like a, you know, you can, you can open your eyes or you can you know, twist around or whatever, just getting that full kind of sense of your body and noticing if it has any urges or desires or pull. Maybe it's pulling your attention in a certain way or there's a, a predominant thought or feeling that's showing up. Maybe just uh, notice that for a second. Don't do anything with it, just notice it. I feel that we are fortunate to be able to create this space with people from all over. 
in in a time that is so unpredictable and that we still get to make these connections even if it's just for a brief second so uh yeah as, as you're ready you can just kind of like you know open your eyes and uh find your way back maybe you fell asleep <laughs> um but yeah that, I, uh, that just helps me like get grounded in my body usually feel pretty relaxed after that sometimes tired sometimes I try to do it in the morning when I wake up and then I almost fall asleep again um but uh actually it's it's a way that I've done some deep uh healing too but um yeah I was just curious if anybody had anything that they wanted to say or if uh like what you noticed by doing the meditation, there's no right answers. Maybe I, for me, this meditation is something that I discovered naturally and it was part of my healing process. And when I discovered it later, I learned that it was called a body scan meditation. But mm -hmm. for me, it was like, oh, these are these parts of my body. Oh, wow. Like, and acknowledgement and answers came from this area mm -hmm. and for me it, i this part of my body is very strong and mm -hmm. for me the heart centers i can tell if i'm in a bad state if i can't feel here mm -hmm. and it took me a long time to learn that because you're not taught that right you're not taught to check in with your body um i i a comment was made yesterday i think if we taught meditation in our elementary schools um, just as, as a non-spiritual, it's like a psychophysio res regulation or just getting in touch with yourself. Instead, we're taught different systems of economics and, um, uh, you know, political science and that sort of thing, which are valuable, but the body is left out of it. And that's mm -hmm. so much, you know, so much can be learned and discovered. And it's, um, yeah, so that this meditation kind of brought that out for me and those different, um, so I lead a meditation myself um, for uh, cancer patients um, who are affected going through the various stages. Um, but that awareness of kind of these different areas and in viscera kind of inside, I think can really help relieve pain. There's a lot of people who are in chronic pain that hold areas that are really um, sensitive and, and pain medications don't get at that. Um, neuropathy is a particular one that one, one patient in particular that comes back again and again, she has uh, neuropathy and we're, we're teaching her meditation to try to deal with that. And afterwards, she's like, I don't, we do a guided meditation. She's like, this, is, I felt some relief. Um, but it's just about uh, particularly sensitive areas when they might come up. Mm -hmm. I, I say, which I learned from John Kabat-Zinn, do you want to dip your toes into it? You don't want to go fully into it, but just around <laughs> the edges, where can you get a shape of it? Can you try to learn what that body language is about? And each person's um, experience is a little unique, um, as you say. Uh, so getting in touch with that is going to be, that communication is ongoing. And uh, yeah, so I really appreciated that, that meditation. Nice. Yeah, like um, when you say that about like having done this before you even knew it was a thing, that, that's another thing that I um, I think we miss out on when we're disconnected to our bodies is that there's so much wisdom in there. Like I was doing these like healing techniques that I had never even read about or heard about, but have been around for like thousands of years. And it's not because I'm special, but it's because that's like written into us, you know, it's, it's, in, it's, it's in there to like, you know, heal. Healing is in there totally, right? And um I, you know, I've had moments where like I was having a lot of like spleen, some pain in my spleen and I went to like a therapist and it was about like rumination uh, of a particular thing that's been like kind of passed down in my family. And um, the spleen is in Chinese medicine is kind of connected to like rumination, right? And so um, by like being able to speak to that and uh, connect with that, that aspect and, and it like came up in like a sentence you know it was like um 
I feel sad that my dad was never able to express himself. It was like something about that. And it like came from my spleen into my throat. And you know, your throat is like your expression. So uh, that's just like the whole embodiment piece and like this self-healing is how it, uh, it's so it just like happens through you and you know, and I used to have so many problems with digestion and all these physical issues that doctors were giving me like laxatives and antibiotics and Prilosec and, you know, wanted to take out my tonsils and all these things that were just destroying me. And I felt so hopeless. And then, <laughs> and then to come to discover that like, I mean, and it's no, no simple task. It's, and it's not necessarily easy. And it, you know, I becoming embodied is painful and it's, it's suffering because you feel things and it's, you, you're you connected now, you know, and you don't get to just turn away anymore because it's squeezing your heart, <laughs> you know? So there are like, um, you know, like um, the small print, right? Like, I do think that this is a reality that it does come with the full package, you know? So that can be, that can be overwhelming and frustrating, but ultimately um, I'm grateful to feel the power to identify what's happening and have it shift. And it's like air in my intestines and the doctor would have given me a pill, you know, like it's, a, it's amazing. So um, yeah, did anybody else have any experience during the meditation or um, feel, feel sort of maybe disconnected from their body um, or, um, you know, have, have done this before or anything. anything I was going to say, uh, yeah, this is something that I remember, I think I had a theater class like when I was like nine or 10 and they did this exercise, you know, lying on the floor and, and I still go back to it. Like it helps me fall asleep at night. And the one thing is like, like Mark was saying about like his chest and, you know, there's certain parts of your body that you don't realize are tense, like most of the time. And if you think about it, like, okay, is your jaw, are, are you like clenching your jaw most of the day? <laughs> if you think about it, you're like, oh my gosh, I am. Or, or like your forehead is like this, <laughs> you know, but if you, you know, focus on each body part is really, really helpful in that way, um, you know, to just try to relax a little bit. And I, I also want to say, um, you know, teaching, um, well, that there are some teachers that are teaching in public schools now, even uh, meditation yoga. Um, I know like my child's teacher had yoga in like kindergarten and first grade. They did some exercise, which was great. But I know in some parts of like the South, I, I don't know, <laughs> Georgia, at least, like I know that uh, there's teachers who've gotten trouble in trouble for even teaching just meditation and yoga is seen as like religion, teaching religion, which, you know, it is related to religion, but like, you know, as opposed to something that can help them learn and so there's some resistance to that, I guess, still in some parts of the country, but um, I also agree that it's really useful for kids. It's interesting because I was actually a board member for an organization that teaches meditation to schools all over the place. And there's apparently a, quite a number of them and, and growing, um, you know, the usual on the East Coast and the West Coast and slow to fill in the middle, but um, yeah, they're doing exactly that, teaching it in a non-sectarian, mm -hmm. non-religious format and focusing on the massive benefits to emotional equilibrium, brain health, et cetera, et cetera. And the kids love it. Yeah, so, I think it's a great way to start the day for them. So. Yeah, yeah. Where are you anyway, Cassandra? What? Um. I'm in DeKalb County, Georgia. Um, oh. you may, this is like near Atlanta. So we're kind of in, in somewhat of a progressive bubble <laughs> where we are, but you should yeah. go a little bit more. Yeah, not far. <laughs> yeah. Chris, do you practice this too? Do, do I practice what? Do you practice like the body meditations or the meditations? That yeah, there's a, a really great book people should look up called Focusing. Um, where they talked about, they were studying why certain people succeed in therapy and others don't. And they found like the good reasons. Mm -hmm. And one of it was uh, a focused awareness of body sensations. Mm -hmm. 
And in fact, I had a, a gentleman here for living with me for about three or four months that I met at a near death experience lecture. He's had four of them. <laughs> and um, he Whoa. became a, a, a longtime student of what is the Gwenka uh, method of Buddhism. And it is a totally somatic awareness meditation. They seek out any tiny little feeling in the body and unpack it to release it. And that is, according to their understanding, directly from the Buddha, from the longest time you can think of, of the primary principle, most successful way to get to the point of enlightenment. Interesting. Yeah, I was, I was fascinated. And, and, and I had forgotten about that focusing book. I'd read it like in the early 90s. And an old girlfriend gave it to me one day, like a few months ago. And there's all my underlines in it and everything. And I was like, well, look at that. <laughs> no wonder I was doing this. <laughs> Do you type that? Uh, can you type the name of that Buddhism in the chat? Yeah, Gwenka. Uh, I, I'll, I'll look it up here and see if I can find how to spell it. Um, so give me a minute. Um, so we must have rediscovered focusing about the same time a few weeks ago, because it's been sitting up on my bookshelf for a little while. <laughs> I was wondering why you were laughing over there. Something that I discovered in high school as well. And I kind of, I read it over. I was like, this makes sense. And it makes sense from a visceral level. And that's why I was talking about there's these iterations. Like I rediscover my body at different times in my life. And it, that generally helps me get through life transitions. It's this correlative effect that's happened where there's like, oh, there's like this greater increase in body awareness, body awareness. And that book focusing and um, some other really great um, references, the body keeps the score uh, for trauma and healing. Um, but other, other, um, other works that, uh, that compile that, that body awareness. It's very uh, critical in um, psychotherapy. It just isn't named a lot. Um, and really the psychotherapist's job is to try and create, well not try, but to show up authentically to create a safe space where that, that sharing can happen, that focusing or that ability to go into oneself while also talking about perhaps difficult experiences that helps move to a different level of understanding. Um, you can analyze. Uh, one thing I was gonna bring up, so Daniel Lendy, who was on here yesterday, um, he would often say in his classes that a mentor told him while he was like stuck on a problem, like trying to theorize it, he's, she said, you can't think your way out of this problem. You have, to, you have to get out there, right? You have to go understand, live with the people or really get into a different space. You can't just analyze it. Um, so it's with me and it's, I feel like it's coming full circle here. So thank you for bringing up that focusing book. That's, uh, been a re a recent reignition of mine in, in a lot of my professional. I'll, I'll, I'll go real vulnerable here and share a quick thing. I went to a, you know, one of those four day long weekend personal growth sessions in Marin back in 2000 and another one in 2002. And they did an interesting exercise um, that we had to basically tell somebody everything terrible that our parents or any authority figure ever said to us that made us feel absolutely miserable. <laughs> oh boy. Take a week. And to relive that. And the first part of the exercise was just to feel all the grief, sorrow you could. Um, I tried three times, couldn't do it. Just sat there with a smirk on my face. So they had me go to the second part of the exercise, which is that person tells you all the terrible stuff. And you're supposed to rebel and get angry. I did that about a millisecond, scared the bejesus out of everybody, <laughs> including myself. <laughs> so <laughs> clearly the facilitator was smart enough to go, okay, you're going back to the first part of the exercise. <laughs> Finally, after 20 minutes of resting and getting back into it, I was able to do it. And I ended up on the floor in the fetal position, pretty much just kind of having a shamanic journey, observing myself falling down an endless abyss of despair and anguish and sadness. Mm. thinking no one nobody this. wants to go here <laughs> third part of the exercise was to hear that voice tell you all the bad things about you whatever and just say thank you for the message and the role you played in my life 
I am complete, you're no longer necessary and be at peace with it. The really fascinating thing happened four days later, my father came over to take me to lunch. We're hopping in his car, we're driving to the downtown to go to a restaurant. He starts getting irate at a driver in front of us that's going slow and I could not handle it for the life of me. I was like, dad, could you please calm down? Dad, are you okay? I had the unbelievable discovery that my emotional armor that I had built up to survive my childhood had been dismantled. Mm -hmm. Giving me a capacity to feel that nobody could have described to me or thought I was missing. You know, I I'd never had any problems of a major sort in life at all, ever. No big psychological problems of any kind. So it was, it was a stunning revelation. Uh, but it gave me a capacity to reintroduce myself to feeling. And it's taken me a good 15 years to finally get to an understanding that I have to just accept that I'm one of those highly sensitive, almost empathic people that has been more, you know, in the news or talked about in the last 10 years. Um, but a difficult journey and very, very valuable understanding of the importance of feeling in the body. So just wanted to share that. Mm. So you said that uh, you had a moment of sort of realizing that your armor had come down. Um, did that take, was there like a period of sort of um, maybe feeling like you didn't have any <laughs> other resources of how to uh, confront situations? Like, did it feel like it was too fast or did it feel like it was at an appropriate speed? I'm kind of funny in that I can, I'm almost like Neo in the matrix, like, you know, stick the thing in me and teach me Taekwondo. And I like, I'm freaked out. And then I'm like, give me more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was going to say like, that's a full, like, that's a full psychotherapy just thrown into it. All right, let's do it. And yeah. you're just like split apart. Um, I probably would not do that with my clients, but <laughs> so, um, you know, that's another way to approach that. I'm also very open and, and wanting to explore those kinds of avenues of healing for people who do want to experience something like that with, with some caveats. What was that? A, you said that was a workshop or? Yeah, uh, a woman named Katie Darling in Marin and uh, it was called Mother Wave. They then changed it to Soul Wave and they had like four separate weekends and it was She's brilliant. I mean, she had everything but the kitchen sink in there. I mean, gestalt therapy, hypnosis, rebirthing, chaos theory, uh, Buddhism, I, everything you could think of. She'd been like a, a student of everything for her whole life. And she had managed to integrate it all as in an amazing way. That was just for me and my intellectual, you know, fast learning brain. It was very entertaining <laughs> and engaging. Um, and obviously high, highly useful. Um, in a previous session a year before, or two years before, we had to do a rebirthing session and do, getting in a hypnotic state before that. And um, I actually, in one of those sessions, stopped breathing and they, I was turning blue. Uh, I later discovered, oh, my egoic structure was so wanting to block feeling anymore back then that it chose dying over feeling and you know i had that realization after another rebirthing hypnotic session that i got the big aha my whole body felt like it turned into light it was just like an amazing stunning experience and i was like grinning from ear to ear and kind of freaking everybody out and they're like who are you <laughs> but um that was my first introduction to a real personal embodied understanding of the egoic structure resistance um, and kind of what I call the ground fault interrupt switch of our nervous system to protect ourselves from kind of getting overwhelmed and short circuiting from, you know, really traumatic emotional experiences. Yeah, I think that's like uh, something I had to go through and see that destruction and then realize that, um, it's okay to have that resistance 
Because you know, I think you know before it was like, oh, I want to destroy all this stuff at once and be done with it. Uh, but that's still just like sort of like kind of colonizing, uh, trying to do everything fast. You know, not always. Sometimes the fast, quick things are good too. But um, I have had to also develop the practice of being accepting of the slow process of evolution and allowing, um, you know, the, the crutches and then, you know, the small like leg uh, brace and then, you know, like a little wrap or something, you know, like it's okay to, it's okay to take your own process and, um, um, you know, find your hippity hoppity uh, <laughs> at the rate that works for, for your own needs, so yeah. I wanted to quickly add that, you know, this, this aspect of this conversation talking about the, the, the struggle, the, the, the danger of entering into the spaces. Um, we've been talking, we started this day with meditation and we're ending it with meditation. And I'm so thankful for that uh, and for the sharing that's occurred here and for the discussion of the difficulty of entering in these spaces with this sort of radical confrontation with self. I'm a mythologist and a professor of religion and you know, throughout history and the wisdom traditions, whether it's Moses in the burning bush or Muhammad in the cave, this 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 radical confrontation with the self um, leads one through a, a kind of hero's journey, to use the Campbell metaphor. And the, the, it starts with an embodiment, but we become embodied immediately into a, a radical notion. And the word radical is associated with with rootedness, right? And our, our embodied radicalness is that we become aware right but what we become aware of first and foremost is our own impending death <laughs> right we were on a conference call last night with some folks here who are in their 80s who have been a part of this organization for a very long time and they were talking about death but they were holding up pictures of their grandchildren and those people are dying too those little babies mm -hmm. they just don't know it yet right and so to become embodied and to become rooted and to become aware is to become aware of one's own finite um, sense of the private self in space and that can create a kind of terror and a disruption that comes becomes very difficult to return from and some of us would rather not live than to have that awareness some of us will go bury ourselves in work or in our minds or in sex or in drugs or in all these other things but if we can keep walking into that space we can then maybe come to an awareness of our awareness and then when we get there right then we become introduced to a connectivity to this living conscious matrix that we cannot deny exists because we can experience it directly. Mm -hmm. right? We can only get out of the way and realize that it's right there the whole time. It's what you said before. And, and these, th these things we need training for decades in, but at the same time, they're written into the very coding of your DNA and you can sense them, right? And, and both things are true, right? At the same time. And that's part of the mystery, what Jung and others called the Mysterium Tremendum, which is that which we emerged from and returned to. And so I, I just want to say thank you for this great presentation and to everyone for their contributions here. I also, before we left, uh, Mark will be officially closing us, but I saw John and Daniel up. I didn't know if they had anything they wanted to add as well. I I mean, I mean, for me, these kinds of things are just really important to do uh, in a group and having these discussions because you don't know where it's going to go and everybody's bringing their stuff to it. And I always say that, um, you know, these experiences and these conversations are, um, you know, it's all <laughs> one of my one of my jokes is, that, you know, it's all compost. It just depends on what you do with it. Right. And so, you know, so to me, that's that's kind of how I always shut it down. Is and it, uh, there's a cartoon I sometimes use, and I some I didn't show it in my last session, um, but it's a little cartoon of people sitting around a table, and and they're talking to the speaker, and they say, "We want you to take us on a journey of transformation, without requiring any real change." And and I sometimes will start <laughs> workshops with that cartoon because you know i want to make sure that you're in the right place because you know we're going to require people to actually have some change here um you know and i think for a lot of people 
um, because they're not embodied and they haven't really thought through why they're doing something, they're disconnected from who they are, then, then it's entertainment and it's not transformation. So thank you, Carrie, for your, uh, uh, for your offering. It was a uh, hippity hoppity. <laughs> So um, I just wanted to add, and then I'll let Carrie kind of have closing remarks here, um, but uh, to also have compassion for ourselves and for mm -hmm. all these different practices. And even if we are just viewing it for informational or not embodied experience, that perhaps the information can come around in different iterations. Um, I had it described to me one time it's like a spiral staircase, right? So we're coming around these different topics or ideas and one day they might click or something might percolate. Um, and so that's something I've had to work with personally, but it, I find it's helpful to remind just everyone in these spaces that we'll, we're all working, we're all um, starting where we are, right? And so to have compassion for that as well and, and to give honor for ourselves where we are for just showing up, and just being here. Um, but I just wanted to, to thank you so much, Carrie, for this, this presentation and this, and this space and holding this space for all of us. Um, and, um, you know, just grateful for this entire conference. Uh, really, really wonderful people and experiences. And I'm sure we'll be communicating this for a little while and talking about our next one and when that'll be coming up. But we're, we're really grateful for, for all the participation, energy and work uh, that's gone into this and that includes all of you. Um, so I just want to hand it over to Carrie, just if you wanted to say anything um, before we kind of round this out. And um, if anyone else wanted to say any kind of final remarks. We'll, uh... Just quickly before you toss it to Carrie, John, thanks for bringing those dogs into the frame too, finally. It was great to hear them in the last session and now to see them is even better. This is just so great. Yes. Yeah, just I was just kind of following up with what you were saying, Mark, about the compassion, compassion for ourselves, compassion for others. And, uh, you know, I think when I when I first got into this, I really uh, dogmatized it because uh, humans are so good at creating dogma. <laughs> and, you know, it was so healing for me. And I just wanted everyone to know um, and that 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 this just connects to what I said before we even started the meditation is just um respecting ourselves, respecting other people, and not thinking that this is the way to go. Um, Andy, kind of like you were saying about, you know, certain people choosing to, choosing death, and I think um, I, res I respect that. I respect that because I, I know it's so painful, um, and sometimes, you know, for me, it's like, fuck, <laughs> I don't want to do it anymore, um, but I keep going, so uh, yeah, just like all the different consciousnesses, all the ways that we're going about it. And then just like feeling, because I get into despair a lot. And um, what helps me when I'm in despair is knowing that this is all a process of coming home. And um, we're not messing up. We're just trying. And sometimes, sometimes we have to fucking fall down and smash our face into the ground before we realize that you know, maybe we need to turn this around because otherwise we're all going to die on this planet. Um, so yeah, that helps me to just realize like, um, just like our own process of disconnection and then reconnection and the cycles in our life that we go through of like fucking dating terrible people and then realizing it and then getting, you know, getting better, eating well, and then all of a sudden eating not well and all our cycles, the compassion we have for our own cycles, having that for the greater humanity, because to some extent, that's what we're doing. Um, so yeah, I hope we, um, you know, we make it till tomorrow and the floods don't come yet. And the ice age, you know, it might be upon us. Um, but if not, uh, thanks for sharing this conscious space um, and, and your comments. So that's, that's nice. So thank you. I would say thanks, especially if those things are upon us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> totally right. You said you said we're all we all have to be in touch with our imminent death, and I'm like, I'm okay with that. <laughs> yeah.
Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Thank you all. Um, thanks for your your vibe, Andy. Uh, you have such a nice, a nice energy. So thanks for doing all of this and and communicating, Mark, and everything. So. It's been a, a team effort and Tom and Anna and our tech team and Mark doing such a great job and just the energy of the container that the rest of these folks in this room, some longtime SAC members, I'm looking, you know, again, Jeff McDonald and David and Julie and Mark are going to see Sharon Mahar is these folks that have been with us for decades and then some names I've never seen before, right, and coming into this space and holding this collective intention. It's, it's beautiful. And it's difficult and it's tiring, but it's also extremely rewarding. So actually, thank you to all of you. I'm absolutely honored to be here. We are so grateful. And we will uh, hopefully see some of you over the business meeting. If not, please check us out and we'll be in, we'll be in touch. We'll, uh, this isn't a goodbye, it's just see you later. So- uh, Mark, you before you-, yep. Go ahead. Before you uh, I'm sorry, I interrupted you. Okay. No, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I'm done. Can I share a screen quickly? Yes. Go for it. Okay. So for folks that aren't going to join us at the business meeting, um, the next time that you can engage with us is actually coming up. Um, please do check out our Facebook page. Uh, check out our website, Anthropology of Consciousness. Um, uh, check out our journal. There's lots of ways to get involved with the org. Uh, if you're not going to come to the business meeting, we'll be talking about all this. But our next public event is actually an event in conjunction with the New School for Analytical Psychology in the Seattle area. And it's Louis Mel Madrona and Bob Romain guy uh, talking about two-eyed seeing, which is a concept that it absolutely is germane to everything we've been talking about. And that's on Saturday, March 27th uh, from 10 to 15. So uh, just check out, just Google the New School for Analytical Psychology and check out their upcoming programs and you'll see it right there. But this is a program uh, if you click into more information, you'll see that we're, we're doing it in conjunction with them. Uh, and that'll be our next event. We intend to uh, move away from just doing these once a year kinds of things and start doing what like Mark and others and Mark Chagoyan and others have talked about, which is to start generating these local regional opportunities. And we'd like to do some in other parts of the country as well uh, for folks to gather and have a smaller, you know, one day or even a single afternoon or a single morning opportunities to have these dialogues. And so hopefully we'll see some of you there. Um, okay, back to you, Mark. <laughs> Thank you so much, everyone, and we'll we'll see you around.